Oh, no, this is next to godliness is not the Bible. Um, it's a good thing to do, but it's not the Bible. Um, and God helps those who help themselves. That's not the Bible. And I found out, well, actually, the, the, the uh, jury's still out. We're researching it. But uh, I could not find, using two different Bible applications, uh, making joyful noise to the Lord. <coughs> so I did find in Psalm 66, uh, Shout joyfully to God all the earth. Sing the glory of His name. Make His praise glorious. I've talked to a couple people over time say, oh, you sing? And they go, oh, you don't want me singing up there. Like, that. And I'm like, well, it doesn't say to be on key. <laughs> it says to make a joyful noise. So with that being said, we've got a couple new songs we're doing today. Uh, one, the one we're about to do is a lot of fun. And then there's one that's uh, more of an I love you song to God that we'll do. So let's just have some fun with our songs. <laughs>
today I'm going to talk about 1 Corinthians uh, 11, 23-34. It says, For I received from the Lord what was passed on to you. Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant of my bread. Do this in remembrance for me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body of the blood of the Lord. Let man examine himself, for no one eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord. He eats and drinks judgment upon himself. Paul gives specific instructions on how the Lord's Supper should be observed. And we should take the Lord's Supper, Supper thoroughly because we are proclaiming that Christ died for our sins. We should take it wordly and do reverence and respect. We should examine ourselves for any unconfessed sin or resentful attitude. We are to be properly prepared. When Paul said that no one should take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, he was speaking to the church members who were rushing into it without thinking of its meaning. Those who did so were guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Instead of honoring his sacrifice, they were sharing in the guilt of those who crucified Christ. In reality, no one is worthy to take the Lord's Supper. We are all sinners saved by grace. This, way, this is why we should prepare ourselves for communion through confession of sins and resolution of differences with others. These actions remove the barriers that affect our relationship with Christ and with other believers. Awareness of your should, sin should not keep you from taking communion, but should drive you to participate in it. The Lord's Supper is not to be taken lightly. This costs Jesus his life. It is not a meaningless ritual, but a sacrament given by Christ to help strengthen our faith. So remember his sacrifice until he comes.
Help us to take this communion in a worthy manner. Help us to remember the sacrifice. And help us to take this communion in love. In some very precious name we pray. Amen. Amen.
and prayer. Heavenly Father, as we gather here to worship you today, we are so blessed. We have an opportunity to provide for our family and have a job. We can earn bread and we put on our table. Today we give a portion back to you. We thank you so much for your blessing. We ask you, Lord, that you bless this offering. Do it to us in your will. In Jesus' name. Turn to uh, 2 John. Not to be confused with John chapter 2. 2 John. Not going backwards. 2 John chapter 1. We're going to read the first few verses and then we'll uh, go into it. It says, to the, el the, the elder, to the lady chosen by God and her children whom I love and the truth, and not I only, but also who know the truth, because the truth which lives in us will be with us forever. The grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son will be with us in truth and love. It has given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as the Father commanded us. And now, dear lady, I am writing you a new command, but one we have had from the beginning. I ask that you love one another. And this is love, that we would walk in obedience to His commands. As you have heard from the beginning, his command is what you walk. His command is that you walk in love. I say this because many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch out that you do not lose what we have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take them into your house or welcome them. Anyone who welcomes them shares in their wicked work. That's kind of funny. Anyone ever have people visit their door? <coughs> 
<laughs> you know, they come to your door and knock. Yes. They want to talk to you about their faith and, and their God. And if you talk to them at any length at all, it's it's different than what you know. And I invite them in, and, and I will. Let's talk. <laughs> they have not been to my house in a couple years. <laughs> they actually, this is, this is the funny part, they actually mail me their literature. Oh. It comes in a yellow envelope. It says, hope you'll enjoy. I'm not talking to you again. I will. But they don't, they don't come to my house anymore. And when I read this verse, I thought, well, gosh. Anyone who does not come with the truth, do not take them into your house or welcome them. Anyone who welcomes them shares in their wicked work. Is that what I was I thought I was trying to straighten them out? <laughs> but maybe I wasn't. Anyways, that's not what the sermon's on. I saw that and thought I'd share that. <laughs> the sermon's on part of that part of that verse that we read. How many of you have a car, truck, man? SUV, something. How many of you drive it? How many of you allow others to drive it? Who do you let drive it? Are, are, we, are we picky or can just anybody jump in and go? You know, I, I think we have levels of... Uh, Levels of friends. We have that person that we met and say hi to. We have that acquaintance that we occasionally talk to. We have that certain friend that we get together from time to time and, and you know we are friends. Then we have that friend that we're always with. Always hang around. Which one of those gets to drive your car? None of them? I have no friends. Who gets to drive your car? That person that you just say hi to? That you don't really know? The one you spend a lot of time with? You allow them to maybe drive your car? <laughs> have you ever seen cars going down the road and on the front has a license plate that says, God is my co-pilot? What does that mean? Don't look all the way over. That means he is in the other seats, doesn't it? Why? He drives better. He drives better? Slower. <laughs> Not necessarily. Uh, anyway, you go, you get to there. Um, what you need to look at it is, is, and, and I've said this a lot of times, and putting the sermon together, I really came to this realization that I was wrong. And I'm going to tell you how I was wrong. Because I've, I've always said, you know, God's the pilot. God's the one steering the vehicle. He's the one getting me from point A to point B. Wrong. When looking through Scripture, when, when we put this together, I, I came to the realization that we've got that all messed up somehow. Yes, He's the one that gets us from point A to point B, but He's not the driver. I mean, come on, I, I walked an aisle in seventh grade. I professed the Lord as my Lord and Savior. I was buried with Him in baptism. And when I came out, I had a firm grip to the steering wheel. I can tell you that very rarely does someone else drive my vehicle. And when we're talking about vehicles and we're talking about control, 
we, we like to put it in essence of the car or the red truck I drive out there, like that, but it's this. It's this. And how often does somebody else drive this? You're always in control. Really? Your boss doesn't drive you? No. Okay. You're, you're, you're always in control. <laughs> you don't do what you don't want to do because your wife asked you to or your husband asked you to. You don't end up working on a Saturday when you'd rather be out doing something else, fishing or something. Yeah. You know, and there's outside forces that control where this goes. And so as I was putting this together and looking at it, you know, we like to say that God's the pilot, he's the driver, he's the look at a race car team. Say Joe Gibbs racing. What does Joe Gibbs do for racing? No, he doesn't. <laughs> Joe Gibbs does not drive his vehicle. He's just the name on that race team. He may be the owner of that team, but he is just the name there. Okay, say that again. Go real slow and say that again. He's uh, what? He is just the name on that race team. He may own it, but the people beneath him do the work. Okay. Yeah. He is the owner of the team. His name is on it. But he doesn't, Joe Gibbs was a football coach. He made all his money coaching for the Washington Redskins. He, he, he's got this name out there. And he got this money and he bought a race team. And in buying that team, he bought what went with it. He bought a car. He bought a driver. He bought mechanics. He bought trucks to transport it. He bought garages to work on it in. He bought everything that was needed for that car to go in circles around the track. That's what he did. And Shannon, exactly right. He's the owner. And if the owner says, we don't race this week, guess what? They don't race that week. And if the owner says, I want that car taken off this carburetor to put on, what does that team do? To put on that car. Why? He's the owner. If you don't, you get what? Fire. Fire. You lose. If you can't get over the wall, take off a tire, put another tire on in 2.3 seconds, you get fired. Isn't that unheard of? 2.3 seconds. That's their test. How many of you can pass that? How many of you could get over the wall at 2.3 seconds? Be honest. They're over the wall at that. It just it blows your mind. The total pit stop is like 5.4 seconds. They get fuel, windshield clean, things tweaked, tires on, he's out of there. Unheard. I, I watched that and I just amazed. But the point is, whatever the owner says, they do. Period. I walked an aisle. I gave control of my vehicle to God. I said, here, whatever you want, I will do. Anyone else say that? Anyone else walk an aisle and do that? Raise your hand. It's okay. You accepted the Lord as your, you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? You were... So you kind of said that. How many of you live that way? Whatever he says, wherever he says to go, no matter what time or what, you do it. You don't ever touch the wheel. I guess Ruby's out. <laughs> you have to look at it. I mean, that's what we said. We said, God, you're the owner now. In Paul's words, you know, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. I have a different driver, a different team in place to take care of the vehicle and to make sure it goes where the owner needs it to go. 
And understand this. God needs you to win. You understand that? Win what? The race. Paul again talks about it. He, he won the race. There's a crown laid up for the winner, isn't there? What's the race? Life. How many of you are winning in life? How many of you are just getting by? How many of you aren't even on the track? <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you. Sometimes, hey, I'm not on the track. I'm freewheeling out there somewhere. <laughs> You know, I did the cross country race thing. But when putting this together, I realized it's not about who drives the car, it's all about who owns the car. I stand before you and I own my car. Isn't that realization is you? As your preacher, I drive more than God drives. I think that. You know, there's things I want to do and things I places I want to go and there's not. And, and sometimes it takes precedent over what God would want me to do and what God would have me to do. And so there I am behind the wheel. I'm not the driver. If God is the owner, Jesus is the driver. They let me ride along. They're that I'm the mechanic in the pit that every now and then gets a chance to go a couple laps around the track. But sometimes in my car, I'm behind the wheel, and my supposed best friend, Jesus, who should be driving, is in the passenger seat. If he's lucky. Sometimes I put them where that acquaintance sits in the back seat. There's other times I tell you this that kicking and fussing, he's in the trunk. <laughs> and there are days that he's not even near my vehicle. And I and if that is true, then this verse makes a whole lot of sense. When it says in verse 9. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. And I'm standing before you tell you that sometimes I run ahead. Sometimes I don't have the patience to wait on God and, and let's go. You ever do that? There's something you need or want and you ask God about it and then you just run and go and do it. You wait on the answer. See, my God has it all lined up. He has it all set in place as to where I need to be and where I need to go. And he says, he says these type of things. He says um, that my driver can lead me to happiness, contentment, <coughs> love, peace. Wealth, knowledge, and opportunity. That's what my owner has planned. And if I give the driver the will, and I go in his direction and only his direction, I will get those things in my life. Happiness, contentment, love, peace, wealth, knowledge, contentment. How many of you want that? Through scriptures you find out that it, that is only found in Jesus, in God, the creator of those things. If you don't have that in your life, guess what? You're running ahead. You took the wheel back. You're not going the direction God wants you to go, and so there's bumps in the road and potholes and Maybe even cliffs that your car goes over. But the neat thing about it all is that when my car has problems, 
when it hits a pothole or big hole or gets a flat tire or blows an engine, there's a team that the owner has to put me back together. You know what that team is? It starts off with Adam and goes through Moses and Jacob and Daniel, David, all the way up through Jesus. Keep on coming and it comes through that part of that team that does that is Neil and Andre and Bob and Lenny. It's you. I'm in the pit stop of the race today. And you're all here with me as part of the team to help me get straight and ready to run the race this week. Just the same that you're in the same pit stop with me and the team is working on you today. Through the songs we sang, through the communion we've taken, through the prayers we've said, through the sermon, through everything to bolster you up, to get you ready, to get you in shape. Do you know what I'm doing right now? I'm polishing your hood. That's all I'm doing. I'm standing here with a rag in my hand as a servant, polishing your hood. Getting you ready so you look good when you go out there and represent the owner. And when we represent the owner, what does he expect? When Joe gets car from the track. What does he expect? Excellence. He expects victory. Every time the car pulls on the track, he expects to win. Otherwise, he wouldn't do it. And my owner is no different. When I leave this pit stop and I go out into that world, he is looking for me to be my best. To run that race. To allow Jesus to take me where I need to go so that I can win the victory. In races, you see different things. Indianapolis 500, if you win, what do you get? Milk. milk. <laughs> A goblet of milk. In other races, you get different. You get, you get trophies. You get just glass bowls. It, 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 it. Man, in this race that we're in, you know what we get? What? Heaven. We get a crown of righteousness that is laid up for us for eternity, forever. So in this life, when your car gets dinged and bent and flat tire or blown in or whatever, come to the pit stop. Allow the team, the saints of the past and the saints who are here now and the people who are running to build you back up and get you in shape. Come and hear a sermon and get polished. So you can go out that door and represent him, your owner, to the best of your ability. So that no matter where you go or where Jesus takes you, you're at your best. Andre sells holsters at his best. Andy fixes boats at his best. Some of you cut hair at your best. Some of you, it's dealing with your neighbors at your best. No matter where you go or what you do, you shine. That car is in pristine shape that they can see him through you. What does the driver get? Went into the victory. He gets all the recognition. He gets recognition. Who gets the money? It's it's split between the whole team and his wife. It's split between who? It gets split between the whole team. The whole team. So if I win, you all get awarded. Kind of a neat system, isn't it? The whole team splits it. However, the owner says it. 
as it does. The owner gives according to merit. I mean, you have to look at it. I mean, okay, we're in this big thing. And when you go out that door, you know how many cars are on that road? And out of all those, you have got to be seen. You have got to make the difference. You have got to win the victory. And what does it take? Read it all. Follow through it. I can't do it on my own. But I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can be what I need to be at the time that I need to be it so that others can see Him, the owner, through me. That's what it's about. When that race car driver crosses that finish line, that checkered flag waves, the happiest person on that track is the owner. He's the one that throws the party for the victory. And someday, my owner is going to throw a party for my victory. Even though I take the wheel back sometimes, even though I don't let him in a car sometimes, even though I make all these mistakes in life, he is faithful to me if I am faithful to him. He is faithful always. And Jesus himself says that he's going to prepare a place for me. When I get victory lane, I will get the spoils and rewards. That makes this all worse, it, doesn't it? The hard times, the sad times, the bad times, the gains and the losses. When we cross that finish line and walk through those gates, it's worth it. So I have to ask you today, who are you driving for? Who's in charge? There was this big fad that went on uh, a while back. People wore bracelets and little necklace things and stuff like that. And on those bracelets it said, WWJD. What did it stand for? What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? And uh, talking to a friend, they said, they said these words. It's not WWJD. I'm going to mess it up. It should be W S I D J. W S I D J. It's not what would Jesus do. You don't go through life wondering what would Jesus do. If you know your word, you know that. It should be what should I do, Jesus? What should I do, Jesus? When it comes to situations, what should I do? Ask him. He's faithful to tell you, I'll show you, and let you know. He's faithful enough to speak through you if you will allow him. It's not what would Jesus do, it's what should I do, Jesus, in this life. So the question today is this Who's driving your car? More than over than who's driving it, who owns it? Do the people out there know whose you are? You have to drive around with a license plate on the front to announce it? Or can they see it in you? Maybe you're here this morning and you've never given control of your vehicle over to God. You've never said, here, take control because I'm making a mess of it. Maybe you're going to turn in that little old gremlin and start driving that nice new Camaro. Does God fits you up for the work that He has for you to do? Or maybe you're here today and you've already got your Camaro. You've dinged it, you've banged it, you've scraped the paint, you've flattened the tires. It's running on four out of the eight cylinders. The things are just rough. And you need a do-over. You need to say, God, uh, 
blowing it. I need you to take the ownership back again. Do with me as you do. Finally, turn over the wheels and the keys and everything and just become part of the team to get it done. Whatever your decision, whether it's the first time to turn your vehicle over or, or just to get it straight with him that you can be doing what he'd have you to do, as we stand and sing our hymn of invitation, make your decision. Steps, God, our paths, make them straight for us. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.